It has been a year today, April 15th, since war broke out in Sudan. Many analysts foresee no end to the conflict and say the longer it drags on, the more likely Sudan will become a breeding ground for terrorist groups. Viewers spoke via video to a volunteer at one of the uh, last uh, functioning hospitals in Undurma. Henry Wilkins report. From day one of Sudan's war a year ago, fighting between the Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces has ravaged Sudan's twin cities of Khartoum, its capital, and Omdurman, its largest. Millions have fled the metropolitan area because of the fighting. Some have stayed, however, either because they don't have the means to leave or, in a few cases, because they chose to stay and help. Momin Ahmed Abbas volunteers at one of Omdurman's last functional hospitals and refuses to flee the city. I cannot abandon them, especially when they rely on my support. Thus, I remain to ensure that injured individuals have access to essentials like food, shelter and medical care. Leaving would only exacerbate the situation for those in need. He says the situation is desperate at the hospital, which lacks medical supplies and security and is vulnerable to frequent airstrikes and fighting. Humanitarian groups and international journalists have found entry into Khartoum and many other parts of Sudan all but impossible. And as a result, the world's awareness of the country's troubles has diminished. Commentators and diplomats often refer to Sudan's conflict as the world's forgotten war. Despite as many as 16,000 people estimated to have died because of the conflict and 8.6 million forcibly displaced, analysts say pressure from the international community is needed to bring the warring sides to the negotiating table. But one doesn't see that happening anytime soon. Sadly, I don't see this conflict as, as particularly ripe for any kind of resolution right now. Uh, both sides think either that they can win or they have to win. Um, and as long as they continue to be sustained by external actors, uh, providing them weapons and intelligence, uh, then they're going to continue this fight. A recent U.S. intelligence report says the longer the war drags on, the more likely Saddam will become a breeding ground for terrorists. One analyst who spoke to VOA echoed this view. You got young people and they have all the fuel. They have the anger, they have the ethnic division, and then they have whatever is the narrative about there is a just war happening somewhere. Leaders of both warring sides are wildly unpopular among most Sudanese. Neither has ever been democratically elected. Yet Sudanese civilians are the ones bearing the brunt of the ongoing fighting. Abbas says Sudan needs external help an intervention. We desperately need international support to address the crisis in Sudan. Awareness must be raised about the ongoing suffering and devastation. Yet, after one year of fighting in Sudan, it seems clear that no substantial help is on its way. Henry Wilkins, VOA News. It has been a year since fighting broke out between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary rapid support forces in their long-running battle for control of the country. Dr. Yasser Alami is the medical oncologist and president of the Sudanese American Physicians Association. He tells viewers Kara Van Dam that in recent months, the fighting has only intensified and that millions of people are suffering. We're talking now about uh, around 25 million people in need of humanitarian aid, so more than half of the population. Hunger is the number one issue in Sudan now. Uh, when it comes to healthcare services, where our organization is operating mostly, uh, 60% to 70% of hospitals are non-operational. And some refugee camps, according to uh, MSF Doctors Without Borders, a child dies every two hours. According to the IRC, now uh, Sudan is the number one humanitarian crisis in the world. So sadly, the situation is getting worse uh, by the day. We heard a few months ago that many of the hospitals and, and health clinics have closed down because it was just too dangerous. They didn't have enough supplies. Is that the same now, today? Yes, exactly. Indeed, around 60 to 70 percent of hospitals are closed. 
uh, one of the hospitals that we at SAPA were running in Medani Al Jazeera had to shut down in uh, mid of December 2023, a hospital that was providing uh, care to 5,000 patients per month. It has been closed since then. Uh, we weren't able to reopen it due to security reasons, and that's the case across the board. Again, almost two-thirds of hospitals in the country are not operational. You have maternity services not being fully provided. Vaccination to kids is not being fully provided. So the health situation in particular due to lack of funding and due to a lack of safe access is really terrible. What is your advice, I guess, for people who are still facing injuries and and hardship and need to get to a hospital? What should they do if they're stuck in various parts of Sudan because of the fighting? Well, you know, sadly, at an individual level, there is little that you can do. I remember in the earlier days of the war in social media platforms like WhatsApp, Sudanese communities were exchanging tips on how a woman can have a safe delivery at home. So it was that bad due to lack of access to hospitals. Our call here is to the warring parties to uh, ensure that there is safe passage of aid. And our call to the international community is to increase its aid to Sudan. The numbers are very clear. The UN has announced that only 5% of its plan for 2024 is funded. Only 5%. Just let this number sink in. 5% of what the UN needs to be able to provide oxygen, medicine, vaccinations, food. The UN has only 5% of that budget. South Sudan is launching a voter registration program in what observers term the surest sign Juba plans to go ahead with elections, even as stakeholders pull apart on the country's democratic transition. The chairperson of the National Elections Commission, Abdenego Akok, told a news conference in Juba the electoral body has deployed registration officers in all the 10 states in readiness for the exercise. But there are protests to the plan with arguments of insufficient involvement for the country to organize free and fair elections which require money and security. Pagan Amun, leader of the Rio SPLM, one of the parties to the peace deal of 2018, urged that the circumstances in South Sudan make it difficult to hold a free and fair poll in six months. The permanent constitution, which is the legal basis for election, is not yet adopted and many other prerequisites are not in place. President Salva Kiel is taking South Sudan people for a ride. Juba's electoral program, however, is also a product of pressure from its allies. The U.S., for example, has insisted the country needs to get out of the transition mode. South Sudan has never held elections since it succeeded from Sudan in 2011 and President Salva Kiel has been head of state since then. He had actually been leader of the then autonomous Southern Sudan since 2005 after the death of John Galang. The electoral body meanwhile says that it has prepared the legislation schedule to be approved by all the parties of the 2018 peace agreement. The decision to hold elections has already received the support of the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who on April 8th wrote a letter to the President of the UN Security Council, Vanessa Frazier, saying that critical mass of the implementation of the peace agreement has been achieved. 